G'day and welcome to Redriven. Now, bloody Italian cars. My issue with Italian cars is that I love them so much. I love the charm, I love the charisma, I love the entire vibe. But the problem is, as we all know, Italian cars have a pretty horrific reputation when it comes to reliability. Like even when I mentioned to a few friends that we were going to be featuring the absolutely gorgeous Alfa Romeo Giulietta, they all said in their own unique way, oh, what an awesome car, but what a complete piece of crap. But like, is it? Like, is this hot hatch just a complete hot mess or is it actually quite a good thing? Like, what actually goes wrong with them? What do they cost to own and operate? What, is, what do they like to live with on a daily basis? But most importantly, should you ever buy one? Let's find out. Now guys, as you can probably tell from my harsh and nasal accent, I am Australian, which also equates to the fact that I'm most likely going to murder many of the wonderful Italian pronunciations in relation to this car, and I apologise profusely. Look, I'd love nothing more than to have, you know, the beautiful rhythm and melody of an Italian accent, but instead we're going to be stuck with this being an Alfa Romeo Giulietta Quadrifoglio Verde. I'm so sorry. Speaking of countries of origin, we are going to be focusing on the Australian variants of the Giulietta range, but no matter where you're watching this from, everything that we're going to be going over should relate to Giulietta's in your local market. Now obviously this is Alfa Romeo's small five-door front-wheel drive hatchback, but and maybe this is at least here in Australia. Beyond that, Australia, Australia, but beyond that, this thing becomes like a complete mess of variants and updates and options and a whole bunch of stuff. But let's try and make sense of it all. Okay, let's start with the simple stuff first. The Giulietta was available here with either a 1.4 litre or a 1.7 litre turbocharged four-cylinder petrol engine or a two-litre turbo diesel engine. We should mention that that 1.4, it has been available in various different levels of power output, but we'll get to that in a second. The transmission of choice was generally a six-speed manual, but an optional six-speed dual clutch unit was also available. In terms of the generations and the updates, the Giulietta was initially available as the Mark I, while the car we're featuring here is a Mark II. But short of revisions to the variant range and some minor equipment updates, not much change between these two generations. But just to confuse things and completely defy any sort of conventions of numerical sequencing, the Series 1 Giulietta was released late in 2014. Remember, the Mark 1 and the Series 1, they're two different things. The Series 1, which is technically the first major update, brought with it some subtle exterior changes, updates to the dash and interior design, and upgrades for the levels of tech and features. The next major update called the Series 2... Again, remember, the Mark 2 and the Series 2, again, they're two different things. It's, it's stupid arrived in the second half of 2016, while the Series 3 appeared in 2019, with both updates bringing their own subtle design changes inside and out, yet more revisions to the lineup and extra equipment and features. Then we come to the range of different variants and additions, and to put it politely, it's a complete shit show. We're talking no less than 15 different permutations from the entry-level TB to the TB Multi-Air, which is then available as either a progression or a distinctive, or then later in the life cycle as a super, through to the hot hatch variants, which are known as the QV, then the Quadrifoglio Verde, then the Quad Verde, and then finally, the Veloce. Then you've got all the various limited and special editions, but honestly, it's also completely confusing. If we even attempted to go through it in this video, it would go for hours and you'd get bored to pieces. So instead of doing that in this video, we have grabbed all of that information and we've stuck it in our incredibly handy and completely free Redriven Cheat Sheets. Our cheat sheets are invaluable as they provide a full breakdown of the car's model range, its common problems, what you need to look out for before handing over your hard-earned cash, how much of that cash you should be handing over, and so much more. Check it out at redriven.com or in the link below. Now I should mention, look, our, our goal with Redriven is that this is to become like a community-driven platform of information on all these used cars. And we generally find it's those that own these cars that are the real experts. So if you've noticed that we've missed something major in this video, please let us know in the comments below so we can, we can all learn from your knowledge and expertise. Okay, so how's the exterior? Guys, it's Italian. There, there aren't there aren't very many unattractive Italian cars. Like design-wise, the Giulietta has been inspired by the absolutely gorgeous Alfa Romeo 8C, and it does share some design cues with the 4C, but it all just equates into this thing looking absolutely beautiful. I adore the Alfa Romeo V grille here. I love all these crease lines that lead to it. It's just, it's bloody stunning. But my favorite angle of this thing is actually from behind. 
I honestly love everything going on back here. I love the tail light design from directly, like from behind, it looks just so squat and tough. And I have an, almost like an unhealthy love for door handles that are hidden like this. That, I just, it just looks fantastic. Now, even these, like these signature, you know, Alfa Romeo wheels are gorgeous, but even the like lower spec model Giuliettas on like the smaller wheels, even they look good. Now look, as attractive as these cars are, there are a bunch of really important things you need to check out before you actually go buying one, not just for the Alpha, but for really any used car. And hence why we've made the ultimate used car buyer's guide, the link for which is just up here or down in the description below. Actually guys, I can't stress this strongly enough. Please watch that before you spend money on any used car. Honestly, watching it, it could save you thousands. Okay, so how's the interior? Well, you know what? Like the outside, design-wise, spot on in here. Like, you gotta remember, this thing's pushing 10 years old. Some of them are older than, you know, 10 years old, but you'd never know from the, from the design in here. It's like timeless, it's fantastic. Even the materials used, like, yes, there's some, some hard, scratchy plastics, but because it's got like a texture on it, it feels more expensive than what it actually is. So the whole car feels way more expensive than what it actually costs. I should also note, speaking of materials used and whatnot, what materials are used in the interior of these, it's gonna vary depending on the year model and the trim spec as well. This is now one of the top line, top line spec cars, so you know there's some nice bits of leather and whatnot. As far as the wear and tear goes, the owner of this thing clearly looks after it because it is near perfect in here. Like all the, the, the leather on the seats feels fantastic. Even on the steering wheel, it hasn't gone too glossy. It is wearing, like the texture's wearing on the steering wheel here, but that's being very, very picky. There's some slight, tiny scuffs on the inside of the door handle here, but overall, like, everything you touch feels right. Like, the gear change feels great. Everything, all these knobs feel good, all the buttons feel good. It's bloody delightful. But the ergonomics, well, for me at least, are a little bit odd. Like, I just, I, I can't seem to get comfortable in this seat. And also, being like the, the hot hatch variant, the seats aren't all that supportive either. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Also, there are quite a few owners have complained that the the vents or the, the fins on the uh, air vents are a bit light and flimsy. In this car, not at all. They feel fine. But yeah, just seating position, I just, it's never quite right. Okay, in the back seat, I'm exactly 5.7 Romano Fettuccini's tall. This is in my driving position. And it's not ideal, to be honest. My legs are pretty squished against the back of the seat here. I've got to do a leg spread, which is very unladylike of me. My feet are a bit squished under the seat. But the worst thing of all, my head. There's like no headroom. Yes, this car has a sunroof, so that does eat into the, the headroom a little bit. But we've read plenty of reports that even these cars without sunroofs, there's not a whole lot of headroom back here because of the sexy design outside. So, yeah. The squidge in the seats are comfortable. The seats themselves are comfy, but my extremities, not so much. How about the wear and tear? None. It's perfect. It's like it's never been sat in. It's a new car. Okay, so how's the tech? Well, look, like any car that's been available for, you know, 10 years and across what feels like thousands of variants and updates, the levels of tech are going to vary from, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other. On the absolute base spec from early in the Giulietta's life cycle, you can expect a six or an eight speaker sound system, a CD player, dual zone climate control, Bluetooth connectivity, rain sensing wipers, front and rear fog lights, voice recognition, and a trip computer. But the higher spec and more recent examples can include a premium nine speaker Bose sound system, dual pane sunroof, an Alpine seven inch infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, cruise control, selectable drive modes, front and rear parking sensors, a rear view camera and halogen headlights. I should mention that the owner of this car has fitted an aftermarket head unit just so he has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But here's what the standard systems can look like. But depending on the infotainment system fitted to the car you're looking at, be careful because some of those infotainment systems are absolutely shit. But in saying that, the actual sound quality from these standard speakers is excellent. Now, trying to work out which Giulietta comes with what levels of tech and what features can be an absolute nightmare. Hence why, again, we put it in our handy Redriven cheat sheets. Just go to redriven.com to check it out. So is it practical wool in the boot? Yes, heaps of space back here, plus the seats fold, like, kinda, kinda not really, sorta not really flat, kinda. And practicality in the back seat, you have two pockets for your redriven Alfa Romeo Giulietta script in there like that. You've got an air vent there with an ashtray, an ashtray in the back seat, gross. You've got a an armrest here with this really cool, like, kind of slide out cup tray that's so clever it's just so simple plus if you've you know apprehended anyone and installed them in the boot you can get into the boot 
by the little trapdoor. And practicality up front, well, you've got like a little bin up here, but it doesn't want to open at all. We can't get that to open. We're not willing to break it to get it open. There's a spot kind of for your phone here, as long as it's like a Nokia 3210 or something smaller, because like a, a current phone kind of fits, not very convincingly. There's two cup holders here. What I love about these, there's no way you're getting a large coffee in there. You're only going to get small, pretentious coffees like the ones I like in there, like espressos, piccolos, macchiatos, stuff like that. That's good. I like that alpha of forcing you to drink a real coffee, not one of those stupid giant ones. Um, there's a little cubby hole here, which is magnetized, so it's nice to use. Spot here for a deck of cards, because let's be honest, owning an alpha is always a bit of a gamble. You've got some door pockets, but they're big enough for a couple of maps. There's no way you're getting a water bottle in there. And a okay size glove box. Okay, welcome to the section of the video that you've all been waiting for and Alfa Romeo fans like myself would much rather skip through. What goes wrong? First up, there are plenty of reports that the rear tail light stopped working, the boot mechanism stops working, and the rear windscreen wiper stops working. The problem is the wiring loom is just a bit shit, and it can actually chafe on the hinge joint, or where it you know, hinges to open. The good news is it's pretty easily replaceable with some aftermarket non-OEM parts. There are reports that the outside temperature sensor can just completely fail. It's a bit of a first world problem, but if you want to know what the temperature is outside, just put the window down and stick your hand outside, if the window works. We are starting to see reports that these fog lights can like corrode and rust and then fail. But again, good news, it's pretty easy to fix. Speaking of issues with lights, there are also reports that the LED daytime running lights in some models are also starting to fail. But the problem there is it's not the LEDs that fail, it's the computer that controls the LEDs under the headlight, which means the entire thing, including that little ECU, that all needs replacing. There are also reports that this little cap at the back can fall off and the actual hinge joint here in the door handle can fail. The problem is sometimes it requires an entirely new door handle and just replacing that is a bloody fiddly job. Annoying. Okay, problems inside. Firstly, there are stacks of reports that these door handles can break. They can kind of snap off halfway here. Now the problem is, they're plastic welded, they're all it's like one kind of one piece. The problem is, if you want to use the genuine Alpha parts, you might actually have to buy the entire door card because Alpha currently don't sell the door handle separately. But the good news is, there are kits available from aftermarket suppliers, so you can fix them. Not great. But, if you do have to fix it, be really careful of this trim piece here because it snaps and cracks really, really easily. And you have to take that off to get to the door handle. So be careful of that. The center console storage box up here, the actual hinge joints are known to snap and they're known to be a bit of a nightmare, just like this one. There are loads of reports that the Blue and Me equipped head units are an absolute nightmare. And as this owner has done, you're better off just replacing it with an aftermarket unit. There are more and more reports that the handbrake mechanism can just break. It's not a major problem unless you're parked on a hill, but fixing it isn't too hard either. On some models, the finish around the dials down here and at the bottom of the steering wheel is starting to go a bit crap and gross. The chrome on the gear knob is known to kind of flake and peel off, but again, just replace it. Owners with large feet, like myself, I don't own one, but I've got large feet, they've complained, and I'll agree with this, there's nowhere for your foot to go between the center console and the clutch pedal. It's just too narrow, you can't get comfy. Also down there, actually kind of behind the center console here, is the ventilation fan, and it can fail. There's lots of reports of it failing. The problem is to get to it, you've either got to take the whole dashboard out or the entire pedal unit out. Either way, heaps of labor, lots of money. Also, make sure that every single button does what it's supposed to do because there are so many reports of just various electronic gremlins in these cars. So yeah, if it has a button, push it, does it work? Now guys, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with these things, and that's sure to be interesting, look, we love making these videos for you, but the only way we can keep making them is with your support. And the easiest way to support us is just simply by pressing the like, subscribe, and bell buttons. That's really all you have to do. If all of that wasn't depressing enough, what mechanically goes wrong with the Alfa Romeo? Well, look, I'm not a mechanic, so I'm not qualified to tell you, but Jim is, I'm sorry. Look, to say these things are unreliable is actually a huge understatement. Yeah, and I know there's gonna be someone out there watching that says in the comments that they've had one for years and never had a problem, which for you might be true. But statistically, out of all the big car manufacturers, Alfa Romeo are the second least reliable car manufacturer. But some people love the brand. And if you're one of them and you have to have one of these, well, be prepared to work on it a lot or pay someone else to work on it a lot. If you're an enthusiast and you wanna have a crack at the repairs yourself, some of the things you might enjoy fixing on the weekends are just putting all the bits and pieces back on that fell off that week. And good luck chasing all the electrical gremlins too. You might enjoy more serious repairs like oil turbo lines and 
complete turbo replacements because they fail too. You might enjoy replacing the piss weak engine bay plastics, everything from radiators to thermostat housings and expansion tanks. Oh, and you might want to whip out the gearbox or the engine and fix that leaking rear main oil seal again and again. Although you're probably better off pulling the engine out because that way you can repair all the leaking Welsh plugs at the same time. Look, the list of things that goes wrong with these goes on and on. And the reality is it's beyond the capabilities of most do-it-yourselfers, which means you're gonna have to pay someone to do it for you. And the problem there is I know of workshops that won't go near them because they're so problematic. And you've also got to ask yourself is, what's it gonna be like to get parts for these now and in the future? Look, some of these that are fastidiously maintained and never driven might go on to become low mileage quirky collectibles. But the reality is if it's more than 10 years old and something serious goes wrong, it's most likely gonna cost more to fix it than the car's actually worth and it'll be off to the wreckers. Okay, is it safe? Well, according to those crazy cats at European NCAP, it kind of was safe because when it came out, it got a full five-star safety rating. However, as NCAP safety standards increase, yet Alfa Romeo didn't bother fitting this thing with any extra safety features, by 2017, it only received a three-star rating. But look, it does feature a whole bunch of fantastic safety features, but to tell you what it has, finally we get to hear some delicious sounding Italian pronunciations. So my friend Simone is going to tell you what it has. Buongiorno a tutti. Sei airbags, freni antibloccaggio. Una frenata assistita della Madonna. Distribuzione della forza frenante. Controllo elettronico della stabilità. Trazione controllata. E il poggia testa. Con le cinture di sicurezza e il limitatore di carico. But again, what each variant of Giulietta has, what sort of safety tech, it's going to vary depending on the range and all that sort of stuff. Again, all of the details are in our Redriven cheat sheets on redriven.com. So what's it like to drive? Well look, if you read any reviews or watch any videos about this, the QV, loads of people will say that these are nowhere near as refined or as sorted as much of their competition. And you know what? Thank God. Like where a Golf GTI is like a, like a super efficient scalpel, this thing's more like a butcher's knife. And look, that's not a bad thing because this thing just feels so alive and energetic all the time. It's never ever boring or dull. The steering is so quick, it's so responsive, it just feels so like eager to like dart around and change direction. Now in saying that, some will claim that that makes the whole car feel a bit skatey and nervous, but you know what? They're wrong. It's awesome. Like the suspension after a few years, it's, it's yeah, definitely nowhere near as sorted as much of the competition. But again, I feel like it just adds to the entire, I don't know, the charm and the charisma of the car. Now, transmission-wise, this is the six-speed manual. It actually has a quick shift kit on it as well, and it's fantastic to use, really notchy, really accurate. The negative but, the DSG models, the twin clutches, they, um, they're pretty old and they do feel it. Pretty clunky old thing. And another negative, there are, yeah, there are a couple of little rattles and squeaks in here, but the easiest way to drown those out is just with engine noise, and this thing, <laughs> sounds, so good. I should mention though, like this particular Giulietta, it's not exactly standard. These were always a quick little car, but this one has some breathing mods and the ECU has also been massaged and it just exaggerates everything about it. It is seriously quick. The thing is, but with the modifications and the more power, it does really struggle to find traction and it does like to talk steer a bit. But again, I feel like that all just sort of adds to the sense of occasion. But in terms of actual outright speed, let's do some performance testing. So we're gonna do a zero to 60 kilometer an hour time and a 60 to 100 kilometer an hour time. Look, overall, what's it like to drive? Okay, it's, it's nowhere near as polished or refined as much of the competition, and that's exactly how it should be. Like, Alfa, Alfa Romeos are all about the sense of occasion and the romance, and it, it should have so much character, and this car, it does, it exudes character. Like, even in terms of, like, the hot hatch world, everyone seems so obsessed with performance times and lap times these days, but this thing, it just forgets about all of that bullshit and replaces it with just a sense of occasion. That's what a hot hatch should be. From a driving perspective, this is what a hot hatch is all about. It nails it. You know what it's like? Molto, molto bene.
pricing here in Australia kicks off from around about $7,500 and tops out at around about $45,000. And obviously the difference in quality and condition between those two cars is going to be a chasm of difference. Something like this, a 2012 QV in honestly superb condition with below average amount of Ks on it, around about the $20,000 mark. And for what these cost in the UK, because sorry North America, you guys didn't receive these, boo, here's a graphic. Alfa Romeo claims a fuel consumption figure of anywhere from 4.5 litres per 100 k's, which is for the base model diesels, through to 7.9 litres per 100 k's for cars like this, the QV. The thing is, but this car's average is 14.9. Alfa Romeo offered a three-year, 100,000 kilometer warranty for all diesel models and three years and 150,000 case for all petrol models, which means all but the very, very latest Giuliettas have no warranty anymore. Also, if a used car dealer offers you a used car warranty, be very, very, very careful. Read the fine print, because quite often those warranties aren't worth the paper they're written on. Alfa Romeo recommends servicing for the petrol models every 12 months or 15,000 Ks, or for the diesel models every 24 months or 35,000 Ks but we'd be doing it far more often than that. Also, and I know we alluded to this earlier, but don't feel the pressure to buy genuine Alfa Romeo parts. There are plenty of fantastic aftermarket parts out there that quite often cost less and last longer. Just make sure you do your homework. Okay, so should you buy one? Well, first of all, we've got to establish why you'd want to buy one. Look, if you want an ultra reliable, safe and economical hatchback, then no, you shouldn't buy a Giulietta. You should buy something like a Toyota Corolla or a Hyundai i30. Yeah, but cool, but what if you want something with like more personality and performance and you're not so worried about the boring stuff like reliability and running costs, then should you buy a Giulietta? Well, no, no, you should buy like a Golf GTI or like a Mazda 3 MPS. Yeah, okay, but what if you want to look sexier than those two, then do you get the Alpha? Well, no, you should look at a, like a Volkswagen Sirocco or a Hyundai Veloster or even a Kia Proceed GT. Yeah, yeah, okay, but what if you still need a five-door hatch? Well, in that case, a Ford Focus ST or even an Audi S3. Okay, look, how about this? What if you want an Italian five-door hatch that is made by Alfa Romeo and you're happy to look past some of the unfortunate realities and you are willing to maintain it and spend money sorting the constant niggling issues out? Then should you buy a Giulietta? Then, yes, then and only then should you buy one of these things. Look, so many of the things that are fueled by lust and romance and passion are quite often terribly bad for us, and doing risky things is just exciting. And look, sure, I personally love this car, but recommending one and even buying a Giulietta probably isn't a sensible thing to do. But when have Alfa Romeos ever been sensible? They don't need to be sensible because we have Toyota for that. What an awesome car, but what a pit Ah, oh, you f***er, it was so close. Here we go. It's inspired by the absolutely gorgeous Alfa Romeo... Alfa... Alfa f me. <laughs> Here we go. Would you buy one of these? Do you own one of these? Let us know in the comments below. And remember... Ah, oh, f*** me. Now, after all of that, would you still buy one of these? Do you own one of these? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, guys, can you please hit those like, subscribe, and bell buttons and share our content as much as you can? That'd be awesome. See you next time.